um, diversity in the Willamette River. So um, I've got a little bit of history of talking about non-bird related things uh, uh, at the society, but um, I think they're all interconnected. So um, I'm gonna, gonna talk a bit about beaver and um, some of the conservation and ecological values, and um, hopefully you have lots of time for questions and answers once, we, once we're done. Good. I'm going to add one thing and then I'll shut up. Uh, if you have a question, put it into chat and we will do questions at the end of Brian's presentation. Okay, so beavers. They're uh, the second largest rodent, the American beaver is the second largest rodent in the world behind um, the capybara, which is on the um, kind of bottom right uh, image of the screen. They're native to North American continent. Um, and typically they're, they're large, larger than most people probably give them credit for, uh, 35 to 70 pounds. You think about like a German shepherd or something that might be like a, say a 70 pound dog, like how big that is. Uh, just give you, to give you a perspective, a beaver in the water oftentimes is huge and, um, and, and startling when you happen to come across one, uh, say out paddling or, or, or out in their environment. Um, a lot of people mistake a lot of our other things for beavers, like nutria. And, um, you know, uh, oftentimes people see nutria and say, oh, there's a beaver out there. And it's like, no, nutrients are non-native, uh, not related to beavers. And, um, you know, things like muskrat as well, which is a native, uh, another native aquatic rodent, a very interesting animal, but, um, you know, also not related, related to, but not, but, but not the same as beavers. So a lot of uh, confusion oftentimes happens when people see these animals and think, oh, we have beaver here. We don't have beaver here. Um, historically, there are two beaver, uh, you know, in the, in the genus Castor um, that are extant in the world, but historically there were others like the giant beaver here, which was, um, you know, compared to a, uh, you know, a average, um, you know, man, quite large, um, probably a little bit more scary than, a, than today's beaver if you happen to come across one of those in the wild. Um, this is the distribution of the two species of beaver, and blue is the American beaver, and or uh, the North American beaver, and then we also have the European beaver in red. You can notice that the the American beaver, um, the the current habitat that they're in is pretty much the the distribution um, historically. Um, there's also there was a translocation of beaver into a uh, North American beaver into Europe, and um, you know several times that's taken place. And so um, because beaver populations there have been have plummeted, and um, there's not many, many beaver left of the European beaver in many areas. To kind of um, restore ecological um, conditions in Europe, beaver, North American beaver have been transplanted into those areas. Um, the historic range, here's, here it is again on the map. Um, you know, historically beaver were, as, as Harry had mentioned, since the 16th century were um, uh, uh, widely targeted for their pelts. And um, a lot of the early exploration of the west coast of North America was done to access habitats for beaver and to, and to trap out and, and harvest those pelts. Um, they were considered like the soft gold uh, back in the day. Um, their value was, was so high to bring people, you know, across the world to hunt for their pelts, um, primarily for hats, for clothes, and for other uh, textiles and goods. Um, they were, you know, hunted to the point of diminished populations, in some locations extirpated from, from habitats, but they were not eliminated, obviously. And we don't, we have an idea, you know, roughly about how many beavers were out there, uh, you know, in with very large air bars around that number, but really don't know um, how many historically were present on the habitat. Uh, diet um, beavers are 100% herbivores. Um, a lot of there's a lot of misconception that beavers um, eat fish, and beavers do not eat fish or birds or uh, anything else. They are herbivores. Um, they do have preferences, but they they will feed on a lot of uh, a wide variety of foods. Herbaceous plants are are, are preferred. Um, things like rushes and cattails. Um, they target willows, cottonwoods, alders. And they're eating the, the, uh, the bark and that little cambrium just underneath the bark. They, they are chewing through logs and they can digest some of the stuff they're getting, getting out of the wood pulp, but primarily they're targeting that just inside the inner layer of the bark, that little, that little um, green layer is what they're going after. Um, they'll um, take down trees to get to the, to the stems and to the preferred parts of the trees they want to, they want to chew on. And they're known to... Um, both cut up uh, trees and cache wood for the winter. So in months when um, things may be frozen over um, or ponds may be frozen over, they'll cache wood down in ponds um, for to retrieve later on, which is pretty cool. 
um, beaver incredibly adaptive to this aquatic lifestyle. On the front feet of the beaver are dexterous. You can think of them kind of like raccoon's feet or like little hands. They're um, clawed, powerful, strong, but able to grip and manipulate things. The rear feet are large, paddle-like, and webbed. Um, they have a split toe on one of their nails that acts like a comb. They're actually able to draw oils from glands in their bodies and then comb that into their fur as a way of um, kind of scotch guarding themselves, waterproofing themselves um, uh, to keep themselves um, uh, comfortable coming in and out of the water. Um, beyond the feet, um, they have, of course, that wide tail, um, which is uh, in part for propulsion, but also it's for fat storage, for balancing themselves and propping themselves up to get to trees and stuff on land, and also as an alarm call and, and a way of, of both alerting beaver to the presence of predators and to um, kind of uh, uh, ward off predators. Um, it's two, two quick anecdotes. Um, juvenile beavers, um, beavers can tell this alarm slap sound of tails. So they'll come up to the surface of the water and slap the water very loudly. And apparently beaver can tell the slap sounds of other beavers apart from one another, not one another, which how they do it, I don't know. But juvenile beavers will oftentimes cry wolf and get up to the surface and slap the water. And adult beavers actually know to kind of take the slaps of juvenile beavers with a grain of salt when they hear it because they are so frequently just trying out this tail slapping sound and uh, don't actually, um, are not trying to, you know, warn anybody that there's a predator around. Um, and a number of years ago, I was out at um, Elijah Bristow State Park, which is um, out in the Pleasant Hill area, kind of East Eugene. And I had, I was uh, counting fish um, for a, a study and had um, poorly planned my day and um, the, uh, the day was turning into night, it was kind of twilight, and I was starting to count fish by, my, uh, by the light of my cell phone <laughs> at that point. And the beavers who were in this pond with me were letting me know that like, hey, it's time for you to leave the pond. And so they were coming up to the surface of the water, slapping it, and were actually close enough to me that they were spraying me with water. And it was annoying, but it was kind of like, okay, guys, I, I, know, I know what you're getting at, but you know, I wasn't too alarmed. And so the, once twilight hit, once, once night hit, um, the beavers just went about their business and started chewing on wood. And the sound of them chewing was so loud, it was deafening. There's probably maybe six plus beaver around me gnawing on wood and that gnashing rang, 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 sound. I mean, you couldn't, it was loud enough, you couldn't hold a conversation. Um, it, was, it was just deafening around me. I'm like, this is so much more alarming than a tail slap, like if you're really trying to get predators out of your habitat, like lead with the gnawing sound, the horrible chewing noise was something else. So um, anyway, that's an aside. Um, the eyes of the beaver have a nictating membrane. So like, uh, you know, reptiles with, with a third um, membrane that kind of goes over the eyes, beaver have that to help protect their eyes and like goggles to see underwater. Um, their ears and nose are highly developed um, to close off and close out water um, under, uh, close, close themselves off for going underwater and diving underwater. Um, they have a second set of lips. So, you know, they have the front lips, the furry little things in the front of their mouth and front of their incisors, but behind their incisors, they actually have a second set of soft fleshy lips to help close their mouth off underwater so they can carry something in the incisors and keep their mouth closed, which is pretty cool. Um, and of course, digestion, their, their, their um, intestinal tract is highly specialized and contains, um, you know, a, a, a special community of bacteria, which help break down cellulose and help them um, derive energy from wood, uh, which is pretty unique. Um, one of those adaptations is their incisors. Their incisors grow throughout their life. And um, incisors being their front teeth, upper, you know, kind of like our front uppers and lower teeth here. Um, the incisors grow throughout their life. And you can see on the right-hand image, that's um, the lower incisor. Well, that thing grows back almost to the very end of the, of the lower mandible. And it's growing throughout its life and being worn down throughout its life. So that unlike us who our teeth grow in, and that's kind of what we're, we're left with, these guys actually have to wear down their teeth and use their teeth over time where they grow too large. And also if one of the teeth begins to chip off or break, they're actually growing out new teeth to replace it. So it's a, um, an adaptation for chewing through wood. Uh, beaver colonies typically are between two and 12 individuals. Uh, beaver are highly territorial and will defend their, um, defend their habitats from members of other colonies fiercely. Um, 
Oftentimes a beaver colony includes a pair of adults or, or, or multiple adults. Um, the previous year's juveniles, so I think age one beaver, and kits age zero. So um, oftentimes they'll remain with the family until they're age two before foraging out of there on their own. They'll reach uh, sexual maturity at about a year and a half of age. Um, the, the amount they'll utilize a habitat depends on the habitat availability and the suitability of the habitat and the amount of food resources um, that are around them. Um, reproduction wise, um, adults will uh, form long-term pair bonds. Um, they have a 100-day gestation period. Um, the kits are born between in, in you know, late winter through early spring, January through March. Um, they'll have, you know, between one and eight kits, typically about four. Uh, females will nurse the kits until they're about 10 to 12 weeks of age. Um, one interesting thing is the kits aren't born water resistant. So they're actually born kind of like the one on the right hand image here, rather fluffy and not able to, if they got into the water, they would, um, you know, the, the water would soak down into the skin. It would um, chill them. They're not water resistant. So it takes them the first, you know, months to two months of their life to begin producing oils, combing that through their fur and actually developing that water resistance that allows them to, um, to swim. Um, juveniles are, they kind of have a slow um, juvenile period where they, they slowly begin to absorb um, the adult characteristics and the adult behaviors. So a lot of that is learned um, with their colony. So um, a beaver lodge, this is an image um, of, of a beaver lodge. Beavers have um, several different types of dwellings, one of them being a lodge, there's bank dens, other ways where they build their, their community. But a beaver lodge is out in the middle of a pond or a water body, and it has a, a dry area where kits and beavers can, can hang out and underwater entrances. So um, beavers are um, highly predated upon. Things like cougars and bobcats, um, coyotes, bears, uh, find beaver to be a very easy meal. And so there's been um, reports of cougars diving up to two meters deep in water to hunt beaver which is um, pretty astonishing. So with an underwater entrance to this lodge or any of their, 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 their bank dwelling um, uh, um, homes, um, the beaver are able to um, maintain an entrance that, that um, predators can't get up into. And so a very important part of their, of their, um, of their lifestyle. So um, both the lodge here on the left-hand image and the bank den on the right-hand image kind of show the same um, characteristics. They um, have an opening which um, is under the surface of the water where the beaver is able to get into and out, to, out of. Um, a bank dwelling uh, beaver might have an air vent that provides some uh, ventilation. Same thing with a lodge, where I have ventilation through the top. Um, but uh, very important that that tunnel remains wetted and remains covered with water uh, throughout the year to keep predators from um, um, being able to access it. So that's a large part of why beavers build beaver dams. And you know, there's, there's many reasons why beavers build beaver dams, but primarily to um, avoid predators. You know, beaver dam in itself allows lateral expansion of a river channel, and it makes it easier for beaver to um, laterally move out and access additional resources they otherwise wouldn't be able to, re uh, to access as easily. You know, you can, once you drop wood into the water, it's going to float, or it's going to be a little bit more buoyant, easier to carry out into the deeper water to store or to, to chew on or to help build additional dams. Uh, dams themselves are built out of whatever material happens to be available to the beaver. I've seen them uh, built out of uh, Japanese knotweed. I've seen them built out of um, blackberries. You know, oftentimes they're made out of willows and things th that the beaver are feeding upon. Um, I've had beaver incorporate parts of my fish traps <laughs> into their beaver dams or garbage will get pushed up into beaver dams if the beaver thinks it's useful to, to push into a beaver dams. Um, beavers will pick up and manipulate stone and mud and other things to kind of pack in that dam. And the beaver will actually be listening for the sound of moving water. They have very sensitive ears. And, you know, in on a beaver dam, they'll be going up and down that listening for the sound of moving water and putting resources into that area to try to seal it to hold back more water. And so um, beavers will build dams to increase pond depth and primarily to keep the front of their lodge or their bank den wetted and um, as a way of, of avoiding predators. But it has lots of, um, lots of uh, synchronous um, uh, um, elements with it as well that help the beaver out um, and, and it's in its ecology and, and what it's trying to do. Um, so not all beaver build beaver dams. In habitats that are already deep enough for beavers, say like the main stem Willamette, lots of bank dwelling beavers live in the main stem Willamette um, and oftentimes you wouldn't even know they're there. The habitat's deep enough in the pools and in and, and, and the deep 
riffles and that kind of stuff are deep enough that the beavers can build a bank dam and access it without having to worry about damming up part of the river to, to keep it wet. So um, uh, yeah, not all builders, uh, beavers build dam in all situations. Um, so the dams themselves allow for floating of logs and branches. Um, it increases the forage area and you know, beavers oftentimes build channels or runs into the floodplains as little um, side streets, basically. If, if the river was a highway, these little channels are side streets, which they're able to get up into forage material and then take them down into the, into the main uh, pond. Um, and as I said, they're built out of a variety of materials and whatever's available. And dams themselves are oftentimes built in succession. So not just one beaver dam, but beavers will build multiple dams to back up more and more water. Or as one beaver dam becomes more filled in with material, they may build a second one to back up more water. Um, so a part of the reason that as a fish biologist, I'm working on beaver is because of the um, ecology of beaver dams and, and the, um, the ecological benefit of beaver dams on the habitat. So you can imagine that when you dam up water in an ecosystem, that water has a hydrologic head to it. And that head says, well, I want to, gravity says, I want to go down, uh, that water needs to go downstream. When it doesn't, the water goes laterally out into the floodplain, it goes down into the substrate, and um, it does a lot of things that we want water to do for higher benefits and uh, to, the, to the ecosystem. So um, with, eco with dams on the, on the landscape, um, it increases water temp retention. So you can imagine that um, you know, beaver dams and these beaver dam habitats act a lot like sponges. And um, during high flow events, they're, they're little reservoirs. So they're there to catch and meter out flow during high flow events. They also fill up in the springtime and meter out water uh, later into the season. So they kind of moderate flows and increase um, the level of, of water on the landscape uh, into a dry summer. Um, they expand the habitat area and the complexity of the river channel. So um, I have a slide on this coming up, but the riparian zone of the river is oftentimes the most rich area on a landscape is this riparian zone. It's the interface between um, land, land habitat and terrestrial habitat and aquatic habitat. Well, beavers on landscape simply um, uh, uh, create more and more and widen that riparian zone, which creates a wider area of habitat diversity and species diversity and richness. So it, it creates a much more complex habitat and a habitat that um, sort of builds upon itself to, create, to increase complexity and, and, and increase these ecological benefits. It increases the amount of wetlands. It increases the uh, groundwater recharge. So um, water doesn't move off the landscape quite as quickly. It recharges into the groundwater. Um, it helps retain sediment and, um, and promote nutrient cycling. So um, sediments get backed up behind the beaver dam. Beaver dams, one of the coolest things about them is they don't last forever. So beaver dams go through a successional process and um, a successful beaver dam may blow out and have, and have ecological benefits. It may fill up with sediment and have ecological benefits, um, but they're, none of them are ever permanent. It's one of the neat things about them is they're part of the um, uh, morphology of the river network and the morphology of stream networks is having beaver on the landscape. So they help retain sediment, um, cycle nutrients and keep nutrients in place. They can help reverse channel incision and initiate, initiate floodplain reconnection. And probably most importantly, they create habitat for fish, amphibians, and wildlife that um, are obligate on these sorts of habitats. And they also can, can moderate stream temperatures. So as I said before, that interface between the terrestrial and aquatic habitats called the riparian zone. And within a reach or within, within a landscape, these are oftentimes the most rich areas of that landscape. The highest species diversity, their species oftentimes are found only in riparian zones and nowhere else. They're highly productive habitats, habitats that um, uh, have a lot of primary productivity and uh, because of that interface between land and water. And they're oftentimes a minor part of a landscape, but they support the highest biodiversity. So beaver are simply amplifying that effect of riparian zones on the habitat. So um, I want to go through a couple of examples here of what uh, kind of the ecology of beaver dams and kind of how they how they manipulate the environment around them. And um, there's uh, this figure here. It's it's um, uh, uh, kind of widely distributed, but um, I think it does a really good job of, of demonstrating some of the principles behind beaver dams and, and their ecology. So um, picture A here on the left shows a beaver trying to build dams in a heavily incised stream. 
And in the Willamette Valley, we have lots of streams that are heavily incised um, through um, uh, the way we've managed them and through the lack of beaver on the landscape. Um, they're they're down cut incised streams. And image B shows what happens. Um, in a system like this, there's a lot of energy in that main channel. The energy has nowhere else to go but straight down the river. If a beaver tries to build beaver dams in this habitat, they're likely going to blow out and wash away. And a blown out beaver dam is not necessarily a failed beaver dam. We, we, we call them failures, but what they, even a blown out dam oftentimes isn't completely blown out. Oftentimes it, it um, fails in one location, in one spot in the dam, and allows water to rush out. But what it does is the part of the beaver dam that's left will actually angle water laterally towards the sides of, the, sides of those incised channels. And what it does is widen the energy has somewhere to go besides straight downstream. It goes towards the side and allows substrate to enter the stream channel and it also widens the stream channel. So as they blow out and as they fail, they're creating new types of habitat along the way. Now, as they begin to fail and they begin to widen the channel, um, the energy going down that channel begins to weaken. And that allows the beaver to actually create beaver dams that will sustain themselves. And um, in a system like this, these beaver dams can oftentimes fill up with sediment rel relatively quickly and or fill up with vegetation that goes through vegetative succession as well. So they fill up with cattails, and rushes and things that kind of anchor down those sediments relatively quickly. So beaver have to build successive beaver dams in the same locations. Um, as they do this, the water table rises. And because these things are filling up with sediment, because these beaver dams are filling up the, the and sediments filling up this, this valley form, the water table is rising and allowing uh, different types of, of vegetation to emerge. Um, the process repeats itself and um, the water table is raised, as you can see here in, in, in picture D. And so oftentimes beaver dams will continue to fail. You'll get floods, things like this will take them out, but the beaver colony will remain. So over time, you'll eventually get to where the beaver dam and the beaver colony will create habitat, which will connect with the larger floodplain. And you'll see these areas where, especially like at the coast range, I can think of some areas in, in the foothills uh, of the Cascades and the Lana Valley, where you have these wide kind of valley bottom forming um, uh, beaver complexes that make large pools and, and um, you know, will, will be the dominant landscape um, in that area. Um, at that point, you have a water table which is fully realized and connects back to the floodplain. You get floodplain reconnection during high flow events, and it's able to moderate a lot of those effects of high flows. You know, it, they expand out on the floodplain, and the water doesn't rush all downstream all at once. Um, over time, these things fill in, and they become either, you know, braided network of channels, they become wetlands, uh, maybe another large flood comes through or a large storm event comes through and it rips a new channel through there. But it's part of the, um, the, the kind of the, uh, what a mature river channel looks like um, in our area of the world. So um, this is an area of, of uh, on the Mackenzie. And um, this, I just, this is an area where I work all the time. And these little orange dots are beaver dam on the, on the habitat. This stretch of the Mackenzie is maybe, oh, I don't know, it's under two miles in length, but I can think of over a dozen beaver dams or beaver kind of habitats within this area. So locally in along the big rivers and the mainstem rivers, a lot of our beaver dams are on the off channel habitats, but beaver are using the mainstem habitats. They're just deep enough that beavers don't have to build beaver dams. And then in the small streams, they're trying to build beaver dams and we're going through a lot of these processes I went through in the last a couple slides. So beaver dams persist in the areas they're able to persist where they're not beaver are able to kind of modify their habitats and, um, and build upon um, a what's there to create ideal habitats for themselves. So in that way, we can think of beaver as a keystone species. You know, beaver, it's oftentimes said that beyond humans, beaver are the other animals able to like heavily modify its habitat, like no other animal is able to modify its habitat except for humans, like beaver, because they're able to, to make and maintain habitats that are so ideal for themselves, and they play such a critical role in like the maintenance of ecosystems and the maintenance of habitats that other species depend on. So um, innumerable species rely either partially on beaver for part of their life history or entirely upon beaver for their life history. And um, I work on Oregon Chub. I've, I've worked on Oregon Chub for about 17 years. They're obligate. They depend on beaver habitats. Um, you know, most Oregon Chub habitats are beaver ponds or, or have beaver in them. In, in them, um, Chinook salmon, kind of in the background of this image, um, depend on beaver habitats for part of their life history. You know, juvenile Chinook, as they move downstream, 
um, you know, utilize beaver habitats um, uh, to grow and to quickly put on resources because they're very um, they're they're very productive habitats. And there's a lot of food available for them um, during the time of year where they're moving downstream and trying to grow to get to a size they can survive in the ocean. So, um, beaver, you know, humans, if we want to if we want to mess around with our habitats, we have to go and get permits and we have to go contact the DSL and the Corps of Engineers and a, a wide variety of folks to plan working on anything in the river. And beaver don't. And um, beaver oftentimes have a lot of conflicts with humans. The way we want to see our habitats managed, the way we want to see, see a river networks managed are oftentimes in conflict with beaver. And um, what might be a, a nice little orchard on the side of a river channel for us that we want to see, you know, grow up and, and, and become a productive um, agricultural field um, to be where they see food. And a culvert, you know, say blocking a stream channel where a road might cross, a beaver might say, you know what, I plug that up, I have a dam right here, it's gonna flood up with water, and it's gonna be a perfect habitat for me. So conflicts with humans and, 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 and mitigating those conflicts is a large part of what we're trying to do. And um, I'm going to go through some examples of how we do that and just kind of talk through them. So um, one of the ways we, we do, we, we, there's a lot of conflicts with, with uh, beavers cutting down trees. And, you know, beavers need trees. They need young wood to, to feed on. But there's also, they also fall, um, the trees are special people, either because they're part of the landscape that people want to want to maintain or for agricultural reasons. So, um, you know, one of the things we can do is, is oftentimes manage beaver by fencing off trees or providing um, education to landowners and, and other people saying, yeah, yeah, beavers here. Yes, they're going to cut down some trees. Let's protect the ones you want. But um, if you want, want the beaver on the landscape, they're going to do these things and, and you know, try to mitigate for um, uh, the damage that beaver are causing. Um, one way we can do this is by installing um, uh, pond levelers. And um, so beaver, you know, they'll increase their, the level of, their, of a dam. They'll increase the level of dam <clears throat> to a point where um, they can they can cover the surface of their underwater den basically, and um, a pond leveler will uh, is, is a flexible tube that's put in um, on top of a dam that allows water to pass through at a certain height over a beaver dam, and it's protected on the upstream end by a mesh cage that the beaver can't get into. The idea here is the beaver are listening for the sound of moving water, even underwater, and so water is entering the tube. Uh, in an upstream location in the, in the pond, passing over that beaver dam and, and then being put out downstream of the beaver dam, you know, the, the outflows downstream of the beaver dam. The idea here is the beaver doesn't, uh, doesn't identify where the source of the water entering that tube is. And they're looking around the dam for the source of that water moving, they can't find it. And so they may try to patch up on top of it, but it'll keep, it'll maintain the level of the pond at a set height. And so um, life expectancies of these are typically about 10 years. They do um, require some maintenance, but um, studies have shown that they're actually cheaper to put in and, and maintain one of these than it is to actually go out and trap beaver over that period of time. It's actually, it's, it's, it's more cost effective um, in many situations. So um, this is uh, us uh, and actually some people on the call here uh, doing uh, maintenance to one of, these, um, one of these devices in Corvallis. Um, one way of, of protecting property is through uh, culvert uh, protection, and these are what we call beaver deceivers. And they take advantage of the way that beaver want to create dams and the way they want to dam up habitats um, by kind of creating these trapezoidal um, screens in front of culverts. And um, it's a way of keeping beaver from damming up culverts and, and um, uh, allowing flow through a culvert, even with beaver in the area. So uh, beaver don't like to dam on the back side of the trapezoid, basically. They'll want to they'll want to dam on the front side of it. And um, it kind of, you, you take in part of the um, biology of beaver and the behavior of beaver and the way they want to build their dams and say, okay, well, if I create this kind of shape, you're not going to want to dam on the front of this thing. And so it allows beavers to have their dams, but also have passage through the culvert as well. You can also put these in, in with conjunction with a pond leveling device in some, in some situations where you can put one of those pipes into the pond on the other side of the dam and allow water to flow through it. Uh, you know, I always think the best way of managing beavers in place is to just keep them in place, find a way to work around beavers. But translocation is also an option. 
problem is, of course, once you've made beaver habitat, it's kind of like having a mouse in your house. Like once you, if you get a mouse in your house and you trap the mouse, it's not like you're done with your mouse problem. You still have a mouse problem. Uh, it's because the mouse got in somehow. It, it, there's there's food available. There's warm area available. Um, you'll you'll get mice again. Beavers and beaver habitats are kind of the same way. Once you've created beaver habitats, or once beaver have identified a habitat as being like I could live here, um, even if you got rid of the beaver, um, other beaver are going to find that habitat and utilize it. So. Um, Maintaining beavers in place is kind of ideal, but translocation is, is one option. We're actually working, um, Fish and Wildlife Service, ODFW, and um, a variety of group around Portland are working with the um, Multnomah County Drainage District to move beaver that are um, in, within the drainage network of Multnomah County and um, to areas in outside of Crabtree, to um, Crabtree Creek area, um, as a way we can't necessarily have beaver in all the stormwater systems around Portland, but um, there are areas where we can move them to. We found found um, some BLM ground that um, where beavers are no are not present. So um, there's a wide range of interest in people in, in translocating beavers, and like I say, it's it works in some situations, but oftentimes there's better ways of handling um, beaver conflicts. Uh, one interesting thing that people are doing is uh, because beaver dams have such, um, you know, myriad uh, ecosystem benefits is in lieu of not having beavers, putting in beaver dam analogs. And so they are, um, they're uh, earthen and post driven uh, structures that replicate beaver dam function without beaver being present. So you can imagine these are like, you know, um, oftentimes out in Eastern Oregon, they might be like say a juniper type post with a very open weave mesh of other of other sticks and that kind of stuff to create something that looks and functions, most importantly functions like a beaver dam, even where beaver aren't present. And so um, you get a lot of the ecological services, the lateral expansion of, of the floodplain, of water out onto the floodplain, of, um, you know, kind of that recharge, a hydroelectric recharge, and um, the, the growth of uh, vegetation that goes along with it without having beaver dam, without having beaver present. Um, this is, I think this is on Crooked River out in Eastern Oregon, um, uh, where they put in a bunch of beaver dam analogs. This location at one point was almost dry. This little valley bottom was almost dry. And there was a little green ribbon that kind of went along with the river on each side. And after the beaver dam analogs were put into place, the floodplain radically expanded laterally. And so you get vegetation growing up that will support beaver colonies where beaver wouldn't have been supported previously. Um, you know, as much as we hate to say it, that, you know, dam breaching and, and lethal removal of beaver will likely remain an option or a tool um, in, in people's toolbox, um, <laughs> simply because um, not every situation will work to, to move uh, beaver or, or to live with beaver um, in these habitats. I want to um, kind of provide one very interesting example. Up in um, outside of Portland, there's this uh, new regional water control uh, quality facility, and um, I'm stealing some slides here that um, a watershed scientist from the City of Gresham, Katie Holzer, put together and, and uh, provided us a tour and and, and descri a description of what happened out here. But it was a site that was constructed oh you know 12 years ago or so, and there's a 13 acre industrial park and commercial park that um, I'm sorry. The site's 13 acres. There's about a thousand acre uh, industrial park that drains out towards this Columbia Slough um, estuary, or uh, um, what I'm trying to say, slough area out towards the Columbia. And they have a 13 acre site where they were going to put in their, their manufacturing and, and designing a water filtration facility. The idea was to clean stormwater runoff before it enters the Columbia. And so it was a, it was a way of cleaning, cleaning the runoff before heavy metals and, and other things entered into the Columbia. They had planned this thing out with an idea of, okay, if the water's gonna enter here, it's gonna move down through this one channel, it's gonna filter through this little weird braided network of channels slowly before making its way out and, and, and um, this would clean the water. Well, beaver colonized this habitat and the beaver had a whole other plan for how, for how water was gonna move through this habitat. And they went through and constructed beaver ponds and um, backed up a lot of the water through those channels. And so the um, you know uh, city of Gresham were like, oh, this is going to be a, a failure. Like you know, several years after this project was implemented, you know, now we have beaver utilizing this thing. Well, what do we do? 
Well, they went through and said, okay, well, we're, we're, what we're concerned about is heavy metals and other pollutants entering the Columbia. So what is happening uh, with those? So they um, looked at the different pollutants um, and the percent of removal of pollutants from the water at, um, you know, both without beaver present and with beaver present. And they saw that with beaver dams present on that facility, the water was actually being cleaned greater than it was with their engineer design, you know, their multi-million dollar engineer design. So um, interesting result. Granted, it's one, one scenario, one case study, one, one, um, one location, but an interesting result nonetheless that, um, you know, beaver, beavers colonize this habitat and um, they actually saw some impressive gains with the amount of pollutants being pulled out of the water um, with beaver present. So management of beaver, um, you know, like, like, um, uh, Harry said, it's our official state animal of the state of Oregon, but it's managed under different authorities. So um, it's managed under um, Oregon Department of Agriculture on private lands, and it's managed by the ODFW um, on public lands. Um, relocation of beavers, the uh, installation of BDAs and flow devices is all done by ODFW. Um, dam removal is largely done by um, uh, Oregon DSL, uh, but oftentimes it's kind of self-policed. Um, there's no state official management plan for beaver, but we all kind of recognize that beaver are important for conservation, but they also create a lot of conflicts in areas where they, where they butt up with humans. So Fish and Wildlife Service, um, which, which I'm working for, um, we have a number of priorities for beaver conservation. And our, our goals are to assist uh, and support fish, fish and wildlife programs and also conservationists around the state um, in, in in doing non-lethal beaver management, primarily through the increased use of the property protection tools. Um, you know, we're trying to support the development of exclusions on private property and, um, and make it easier for people to um, and streamline, basically, the way that people put these um, um, in place. And so the way that people utilize these. Um, we have, uh, uh, we uh, recently, Put together a memo with ODFW to kind of as a joint memo of how of beaver management, and it has a step down approach. Which um, before um, I, we didn't have a step down approach before. And I think most people went to the lethal removal option uh, first. But our step down approach to working with with beaver is that we try to work for acceptance of beaver on the landscape. Um, you know. Meaning that acceptance may not work in every situation. How do we manage the property by uh, putting in pond levelers, beaver deceivers, uh, fencing to keep beavers on the landscape? Uh, beyond that, we go into dam breaching, trying to relocate the beavers. And then eventually, yes, lethal removal is, is, is an option if those other things don't work. But the idea here is to keep beaver on the landscape wherever possible and to utilize those um, non-lethal uh, protection tools where we can. Um, there's some great tools out there. I think if, if for people on, on, on the call tonight or on the talk tonight um, that might be interested in like, well, what, what else is out there for beavers? There's a beaver restoration guidebook that was put together by Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, and, and a bunch of folks um, that um, is currently getting another revision right now. Um, I'm sorry, my dogs are cutting. Guys, thanks. Puppies. Uh, <laughs> sorry, guys. <laughs> And there's a number of local beaver um, uh, related uh, uh, organizations and, and um, in the area, uh, the Beaver Coalition in Southern Oregon, um, Oregon Beaver Works and in, in, in Beaver State Wildlife Solutions. Uh, local to our area, there's a new organization, the Mid Willamette Beaver Partnership um, that's getting started. Um, they're uh, an upcoming project. They're looking to collect information on um, local beaver use. And I know that they're uh, starting to kind of, they're getting off the ground now, but they're looking for ways to get um, uh, public engaged in beaver. And they're looking for things like say, how to get the public to go out and record beaver sightings, much the same way that Audubon might do um, bird counts or bird surveys, how do we do beaver surveys? And what they're doing is, is uh, using, um, online tools and soft, software basically to model beaver habitat on the landscape and then doing on the ground surveys to figure out our beaver utilizing all the habitat that's actually available to them and um, looking for areas and opportunities where those are matching to do more work. Um, so that's pretty much it for what I have. Um, how are we at with time guys? Uh, here time for Questions and answers, sure. Uh, 
Um, so Harry, do you want to uh, lead us in questions and answers? Yes. Uh, first question is, how do beavers learn to build their lodge? Are they taught by their parents? Um, this must simply be an innate ability. I don't believe they're they're necessarily taught to build a lodge, but they're likely looking. I'm sorry, my dogs are used to getting a hike about, <laughs> and they didn't get it today. And they're letting me know in as many ways as they possibly can that they're upset. Um, uh, no, they're not necessarily taught to to. Um, to, to build a lodge, but they are looking for opportunities to, to build a lodge. So like I say, there's bank dwelling beavers that are able to get in and, and build in areas where the substrate would allow it or the, the landscape would allow them to put, a, to put a bank den in. There's beaver that are putting in um, lodges against the side of a bank or lodges out into a pond or a river. And they're simply looking for the opportunity for this. I don't necessarily think that they're, they're trying to build one or the other over anything else. Okay. Uh, next question. Do beavers have more than one lodge at a time? I've seen more than one beaver lodge on a pond, like at Round Lake in the Brighton Bush here. Um, I believe that beaver, you know, um, if they were extirpated from, I'm sorry. Guys. <laughs> out, out, out. Go, stop. They'll go out and tear up your sofa. I'm sorry, guys. I didn't, know, I didn't know the dog playroom was going to become my office. <laughs> beaver and beaver will utilize a habitat and leave a habitat. Um, and so there could be areas where beaver were utilizing a habitat. The habitat uh, either began to fill in and they decided, no, we're going we're gonna to abandon this and move on to a new area. Thus, there might be a lodge there that the beaver colony has abandoned or the beaver were, you know, killed off by, by a predator when they're going up on land or something like this and abandoned. I don't believe they would maintain multiple lodges at a time. I, I don't think that's, um, you know, I don't think beaver are doing that. I have read that most beavers in the Willamette Valley, Basket, Enkany, Finley, don't build lodges but use banks instead. What is your experience with the Willamette Valley beavers? Yeah, I've... I have not seen, there are areas where I can think, I can think of, um, you know, dozens of sites where we do have lodges, um, you know, up on the family refuge, there's um, a bunch of beaver lodges in that that are out in the middle of ponds in these large, um, you know, full valley bottom expanding um, ponds. However, I think a lot of the beaver um, out there are utilizing bank stands um, in a lot of habitats. Okay. Uh... Somebody said they're starting a GoFundMe account so you can replace your door. Uh, and another oh, one says, great presentation, <laughs> hilarious background noises. Uh, does anybody else have another question for Brian? There's, there's some questions in the Q&A. Um, okay. Mary. I'll get them up. Uh, what are beavers' climbing abilities? How high do fences need to be to keep them from getting to a tree? That's a good question. I, I like that. I, um, I, yeah, I've seen beaver climb up and they're oftentimes using that tail, you know, propping themselves up and they, and they can climb up things. I have never seen, uh, I've never seen beaver climb more than a couple feet though. You, you never see them climbing, you know, 20 feet up into a tree and starting chewing, chewing on something. It's always, you know, right near or at ground level. I don't believe their climbing ability, you know, the fencing I see, gosh, I don't have an answer for how high it should be. I've never seen anything more than say, you know, four to six feet, something like that, of the fencing that I've seen people utilize. Okay. Uh, what is the population headcount of beaver in Oregon, generally compared to before they were practically decimated? And I will add one other line. Uh, did the Native Americans hunt them as well? The Native American thing, I, um, I don't know. And I would love to know more about how the Native Americans both viewed beaver and utilized beaver um, I don't know, to be honest. Uh, that question is a really good one. As far as the number of beaver in Oregon, I don't think we have a very good answer for, and I say, let me back up. People can estimate, like we think there are this many number of beaver on the landscape in Oregon, um, or we can say, we think that occupancy of beaver on the landscape looked like this. 
but because we have we have very poor records going back to you know i mean you know beaver have been hunted in oregon you know for 200 years and we have very poor records for what beaver might have looked like historically especially as you know european colonization began coming in we are changing those habitats relatively quickly and a lot of the early management we did was was pretty radical on, on things that would um, impact beaver so i hazard to guess what the original population would look like surely it's lower now than what it was previously but um you know as far as what was the extent of beaver habitat you know clearly it was it was greater before but how much of that has been reduced and, and like say in a in an area that does have beaver historically how many beaver were did that habitat support versus what's supported now uh, i don't know and there are, we have a lot of questions Some, something that we're working on now is asking okay well in the areas that don't have beaver why is that is it because management has changed like say of our of our stream now the stream is so degraded that it won't provide habitat for beaver is because the way we manage our forests has changed greatly and the kind of um the kind of succession you would see in forests isn't occurring especially on in riparian zones and do we need to encourage other management types in those habitats to try to encourage beaver and you know that's kind of a, a strange statement mostly because we've gone to protect riparian zones as a way of protecting um, water and a way of protecting salmon runs and and you know for a you know there was a time in Oregon where we clear cut right down to the to the streams in a lot of in a lot of areas we backed off on that for, <laughs> for very good ecological reasons but in doing so are we creating these dense mature stands around our rivers that historically would have gone through, you know, succession and that, you know, stands would have, you know, trees would have fallen down and died and or burned or, you know, and you would have young vegetation coming into areas that may not see it as regularly now. And so there's questions like this, and I don't know that we necessarily have a very good answer for. So, sorry, that's a really long and convoluted um, way of saying, like, I'm not 100% sure. Right. Okay. What is the outlook like for beavers with climate change? Can they help? Can we help them more? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think beavers are an ally in some of the effects that we could see of climate change in a, in a, in a warming world and in a world that we are concerned about water and wildfires and, and things like this. There are gonna be areas where I think that beaver could be very useful and very, um, you know, as far as in the ecological sense, very important for us to, to make sure we have them on the landscape and present to help retain water as long as possible and help, you know, create those sponge-like conditions within a watershed to help hold on to water and hold on to it longer so that we can, you know, have um, that kind of buffer uh, for, some of the, for some of the warming and drying effects. Here's another question uh, from somebody else, and I would advise them, whoever's asking this question, to leave a name, that your email is on the screen. Is there a way for somebody to look at my farm and help us see if we can attract beavers? Um, have, them, have them reach out to me. There's a lot of people doing beaver conservation work these days, and a lot of, it's, it's picking up a lot of momentum, which is really exciting to see as someone who, who you know, beavers are very important to me for, to me for a lot of reasons. But um, email me, and if you're in an area that has some active uh, people doing active beaver work, I'll get you in touch with them. Great. Can you find out from Native Americans about how they treated work with beavers? I would love to. You know, I, I, well, I actually asked that question to someone last week about they were, um, some of the, our local tribes are getting involved with some of the beaver organizations. And so I, I asked that question okay, so what was their involvement like? And, and that person was like, well, I'm not 100% sure, you know. So I would love to. It's something that's on, been on my mind recently, and I just, I simply don't know. Okay. Uh, to your knowledge, is the Oregon Department of Agriculture moving toward educating and encouraging private owners on non-lethal methods of living with beavers? I... I, uh, Oregon Department of Ag in general, I don't know. Um, there, you know, um, we are mostly working with um, uh, ODFW on um, a lot of these issues, and I'm not 100% sure where ODA sits on, on this stuff. I know that a lot of the people we're working with are working with 
a variety of other you know, state and federal agencies to promote beaver, to promote beaver, uh, uh, to promote uh, beaver related management. I assume that includes ODA, but um, I've not been working with them personally. Okay. Uh, I think that's the end of our questions, unless somebody's got anything else. Thank you very much, Brian. It's been, oh, wait, wait, here's a new, here's a new chat question. Yeah. Can you comment on the effect beavers have on creating habitat for bird life? Is bird life in the area increased when beavers are active? Is research being done on this? No, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's plenty of species that are, I look at beaver habitats as being these extremely rich um, habitats for all for all kinds of things, right? So I think of like red winged blackbirds or something like this that are that are utilizing those kind of you know uh, swampy habitats that beaver create. And there's I'm not a bird. <laughs> I have to admit this right off the get go. I'm not a bird, but so I don't I don't um, I, when I see a bird I'm like it's a bird, um, and I, I'm not necessarily identifying it to species. So. I know that there's a lot of a lot of um, primary productivity in these habitats, which is creating a lot of food for insect life. And there's a lot of things that are taking advantage of that in these habitats. So yes, in those habitats, lots of birds, there's a lot of bird use. Uh, there's a lot of obligate species in these kind of habitats. I couldn't tell you which ones they are though. Well, I can tell you some of them, great blue heron, high-billed grebe, uh, coots in the winter, dabbling ducks. I can think of a long list. Uh, how do you foresee climate change affecting beaver habitat and the impact on the interrelated species, animals, and plants? I it, that's a that's a tough question, and um, you know, you yeah, that's um, there's going to be that, that's a hard one to answer because um, you know, water is managed in such a, in, in so many ways here in, in the state, and you'll have areas that are, you know, right now that are snow driven, snowpack driven, that are going to go to, to rain driven, and areas that are currently rain driven that may continue to be rain driven. We have areas of the state we're likely going to see, you know, uh, declining, um, declining uh, rivers that are declining fat, uh, what I'm trying to say here, rivers look like summertime conditions earlier in the season and later in the season what we're currently seeing. The impact of beaver, can beaver um, help kind of mitigate some of those efforts? Absolutely. But um, I don't know necessarily how like say willows are gonna respond or what vegetation is gonna respond like in those, in those situations, how our local infrastructure and economies and, um, and, and um, communities are going to respond to, to some of these things. There's a lot of factors at play that's hard to, it's a hard question to answer here. <laughs> okay. Uh, what, this is more of a comment, but you might want to comment back. Uh, Oregon Department of Agriculture has an ag water quality program that would perhaps be the one most likely to relate to beavers. Okay. Uh, I don't know whether you have any experience with that or not i don't have much experience with, I, yeah I, I, most of my work has not been with oda at this point so um that's great and i'll, I'll make <laughs> I'll, I'll make note of that okay two or three other quick notes can you work with oregon state university and other universities educate about the benefits and importance of beavers absolutely and um we we there are um, researchers at Oregon State University. There's um, and and that and the research community that's around Oregon State University um, is doing a lot of beaver work. Okay, if I'm out birding and I encounter an area with beavers, can I snoop around or does it disturb them? Uh, beavers are primarily not nocturnal, and like I said, I snoop around. I um, you know they're they're um, uh, in the habitats that I've been in, like. There are areas in downtown Portland that have beavers. There are areas that have a lot of human interaction around them. But being primarily nocturnal, we're, you guys aren't birding at night, I assume. And oftentimes the human interactions are not happening at night. So it's, beavers are, are pretty resilient to that, to that kind of disturbance. Okay, I think our last question, how, does beaver, how do beaver dams affect water temperature? Oh, yeah. That's a... Uh, um, again, this is a, you know, like a pretty big topic. So you can imagine that water flowing downstream into a beaver dam, if, the, if there's open canopy 
um, and the water is slowed down. And, and oftentimes I would say open canopy because beaver are making a pool and a large wide pool. And this, these are oftentimes water will be slowed down. You can have areas where beaver, where the water is warmed um, in the beaver pond. And so you get warmer water in the beaver pond, but you'll have uh, interaction with groundwater. So the, the, like I say, the hydraulic head of the beaver dam itself is pushing water down into the substrate and it's pushing water laterally out into the floodplain. And so that water is recharging this, what we call the hyperreic zone. It's, the, it's, a, it's a zone of interaction between surface water and groundwater. And so you get this recharge, the hyperreic zone, which we believe that downstream you'll see benefits to. You'll see water re-entering the stream in areas um, it'll be cooler than it entered. Uh, that said, at the beaver dam itself, water might be warmer and uh, water coming, spilling right over the top of the beaver dam may be warmer than the water entering. But, um, so it's, it's, there's, there's multiple impacts there. Um, if water wasn't traveling through the beaver dam and say, let's say, let's say water wasn't flowing over the surface of the beaver dam, flowing through the beaver dam slowly, you may have a cooling effect of that water because it's being slowed down. You also get this um, stratification of water. So in, in areas where water is, is stopped, and a lot of the areas I work with in the Willamette in the summer, you have a beaver dam where the water is literally just dammed up and backed up behind the dam and a trickle is coming through the dam. Well, you'll get this little upper epilimnium of hot water. It's stratified on the surface and the rest of the water will be relatively cool underneath it. So the first you know, couple inches is, is hot, but everything underneath that is oftentimes very cool. In some of the habitats I'm working at in the Willamette, that water in those beaver dams that's down deep will be cooler than the river. And so it's diverse. <laughs> it kind of depends on, it's, you can't just put a stamp on it and say it's cooler or it's warmer or it's, it, it's, it's a very complex subject because of, of all the different interactions between habitat and flow and the situation in which beavers are working. Right. Well, thank you very much. And